Hi, everybody. Welcome to our BBB webinar. We are going to get started very soon, um, so please hang tight. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Navigating Employee and HR Questions During COVID-19, hosted by BBB Serving Connecticut. This is a part of our COVID-19 webinar series. Um, we're going to be covering a lot of topics today about HR, um, any employee-employer questions. Um, my name is Luke Fry. I am not Jackie McKnight, although my account says that. Um, and I'm going to be moderating today. I also have a great staff member, Joni Green, who's going to be helping out with some Q&A later in our broadcast. Just a reminder, everybody is in mute. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in your questions box. And we are going to try to cover as many questions as possible during our Q&A. Um, unfortunately, if you have called into our broadcast today, you are not going to be able to ask any of your questions at this time. However, if we don't cover your question or you have a dire uh, question still, you can always email me at lfry at ct.bbb.org. Um, also, if you are logged in by your computer, you can see that we do have a handout. We have the PowerPoint slide deck available to download. We've included a lot of great links to resources. Um, so if you would like to download the PowerPoint, that is available over in your handouts tab. Um, uh, prior to opening up with Mark, uh, we kind of chatted about a few great uh, FAQ documents available online now that he is actually going to be uh, covering some. Um, and we have those sites up on your screen right now. Um, if you have called in, they are the Connecticut Department of Labor at ctdol.state.ct.us. They have a great FAQ uh, PDF you can download. They update it frequently. Uh, there's also some great resources at irs.gov and dol.gov as well. And then also, um, Mark Soicher is from CBIA. So CBIA has a great site and some great resources as well. So you can always go to cbia.com and uh, you can also go to bbb.org slash small business. And we also have um, a lot of great consumer and employer articles uh, on there as well. All right, and uh, today, like I said, we are going to be speaking with Mark Switcher. He is the Human Resource Counsel uh, from CBIA. Thank you, Mark, for taking time out of your day to join all of us um, who have questions about how to sort of navigate their HR and employment questions right now. So um, I'm going to kind of kick it off, and let's first kind of clear up um, the difference between furloughing employees, laying off employees, um, and if you aren't able to keep everybody employed, how do you choose uh, between these two? Okay, uh, thanks for having me, Luke. Uh, uh, looking forward to hopefully providing some good information to people. Um, it's uh, literally been like drinking from a fire hose over the last three weeks or so in trying to both absorb all of the information uh, that's coming out from various sources, uh, try to put it into context and uh, apply it to, to myriad practical circumstances that companies are dealing with, and, and fielding just literally hundreds of uh, emails and phone calls uh, over a short period of time. Um, uh, this was one of the initial questions that came up, and interestingly, 
I really hadn't thought that much over the last few years about the difference between furlough and layoff. Uh, and uh, furlough is, is really not necessarily a legal term uh, with any significance to unemployment uh, for purposes of eligibility, but um, has, has more been an employee relations term that's been used over the years. And in, in, in digging through some older references to that, uh, to try to get a handle on how best to characterize it and apply it. Um, I think that the easiest way to look at it is a, a furlough uh, is, is a characterization of a, a temporary separation with an employee or a cessation of work for that employee. Uh, it, it's not intended to say goodbye, we'll see you, uh, have a nice life, it's been nice, but, but rather uh, because of circumstances, whether a, a business downturn, which it's been used in, in the past, or uh, an interruption in business because of a weather event or uh, a health issue like we're faced with today, uh, it's uh, we don't have work for you for the time being. And, and oftentimes in, in characterizing this uh, temporary lack of work uh, characterized as a furlough, a company might offer to uh, preserve someone's seniority for when they return to work if seniority is an issue in their status, um, preserve their PTO, uh, level of uh, accrual uh, so that when they come back to work they will still have that paid time off available to them uh, because it's not really a, a an intended long-term or permanent separation and then possibly also the third element that's often included in the arrangement for a furlough is some type of continuing assistance with group health coverage uh, during the interim period now um, as, as far as the second item there the PTO time uh, to preserve that uh, state law has a provision that says when an employee separates, um, they are the employer is obligated, in, in accordance with their policy or consistent past practice, to pay out all earned but unused PTO. I have not been able to get a clear indication from the Connecticut Labor Department whether they would step in and enforce a payout of, of accrued but unused PTO uh, in a furlough situation. I, I would hope they would respect the option of uh, having the employer retain that uh, for use when the employee returns, or if the furlough turns into a permanent separation, then it would get paid out. Uh, but not, not completely sure what their position would be on that. Um, I, I've been advising employers generally to try to preserve the time if they can, because the employee will be getting unemployment during this interim period. And um, if, if they're going to use PTO time, if it's going to be paid out, uh, then they're not going to be eligible for unemployment. Um, with respect to the continuation of group health coverage, um, employers have, uh, ra rather than switching over to COBRA, if, if they can uh, avoid going through that process because this is hoped to be only a temporary situation, I think the insurance carriers have indicated that in general they will allow uh, employers to continue to carry individuals on a furlough status for some period of time uh, as as though they were still active actively employed and thereby eligible as an active employee. Um, I, I suggest checking with your carrier uh, to determine whether or not that's uh, an available category for continuing coverage. Um, and uh, I, I know under the CBIA group insurance plans that we offer, our carriers have indicated that they will accept the employer's decision to continue to carry that person as an active employee. Uh, now, during that time, the employer can either charge the person what they were charging while they were still employed, uh, or in some cases, employers have been picking up the full premium uh, for workers uh, during, during that furlough period. That's really a discretionary matter on, on the part of the employer. Uh, the term layoff, in contrast, is uh, separation, uh, we don't have any work for you, and uh, we don't know if if or when we would ever have you return to work, but for now, you're separated, and um, we're, we're parting ways. Um, in both cases, uh, if there's a lack of work and the employee is not otherwise eligible for income from another source, uh, they would be eligible for unemployment benefits. So I'll shut up for the moment there because I could roll on with more stuff with that. But uh, for a long <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. We, we do we do have a sample, and I, I know you have the CBI website there, cbia.com. Within CBI's website, we, we have been 
I, I, I characterize it as, as the attic where you, you, where you shove a lot of stuff that's good you want to hang on to and hopefully access at some point. We, we've been pushing in, into our website and out to companies as much information as we can gather. And uh, within the coronavirus section there, there is a link to some additional resources, which includes a sample furlough letter uh, an employer could download and, and use if they're uh, going to be furloughing employees, because it is important to characterize it for employees uh, so that there's good, good communication on that. All right, um, and then we also had a question. So for those who don't know, what is the shared work program and how can that help an employer actually save money? Yeah, the, the shared work program is a, a program that's been around for many years and uh, it, its intent uh, was as it's historically been used when a company is faced with a, what is expected to be a temporary downturn in business not requiring laying off a lot of people, uh, but laying off some people possibly. Uh, and what often happens then uh, when the company does that uh, and, and expects work to pick up again in the future, um, those folks who are laid off uh, may collect unemployment for a period of time, but oftentimes go off and find a job somewhere else. And the employer then loses that institutional knowledge and skill. Uh, so under the shared work program, rather than laying laying off a number of people completely and parting ways and risking never having them come back again. Uh, it's to share the work that's available among a larger population of workers and, and reduce the work hours uh, and income for a larger group of employees uh, to a, a lesser degree than total unemployment. Normally, uh, and and uh, what, out, outside of the shared work program, if a worker has a reduction in work hours during a week, um, it is possible for them to apply for partial unemployment benefits. But without the shared work program, uh, when someone would be partially unemployed, uh, the unemployment system would determine what amount of benefits they would get if they were totally unemployed, which is about half pay up to a maximum. And, and then reduce that total unemployment benefit rate by the two-thirds of what they actually received in wages that week. So uh, the simplest arithmetic example of that is if someone's reduced to a three-day work week, their two-and-a-half day or a half-time amount of unemployment benefits would be reduced by two-thirds of the three days wages they got, which would leave them with about a half a day of unemployment benefits, replacing the lost two days uh, of, of, uh, of income, so they'd end up with about three and a half days of income uh, in, in that partial unemployment situation. Under the shared work program, they apply the 50% unemployment benefit rate to the reduction in, in hours and earnings. So the employee in that three-day work week would end up with about a day's pay of shared work unemployment benefits to supplement their three days of wages. So they'd end up with about four days of pay uh, uh, in a week when they're only working three days. Um, and uh, companies have to apply to the Labor Department for approval with that. Um, the application process may take a little bit of time, an hour or two, uh, to pull the basic information together and then submit the workers they would like to have participate in the shared work benefit program, and, and I advise companies to submit as many employees as they think might be uh, have their hours reduced, and it's incredibly flexible. Uh, once approved, the company can then reduce hours for whichever workers they need to, and, and so they can shift from department to department uh, among different employees from week to week, and then in uh, rather than the employee submitting for unemployment benefits, the company submits to the Labor Department a list of employees whose hours have been reduced, and the unemployment office will then issue unemployment checks uh, as shared work benefit payments to those who have their hours reduced. Uh, the company is not restricted from laying people off at the same time if they have to. Uh, the only restrictions are they have to have at least two people participating in shared work benefits, and they have to maintain other 
benefits like medical insurance at at the full employment rate. So there's a bit of a, a, an additional cost to an employer rather than laying someone off. But it's a way to hang on to people and, and supplement uh, their partial earnings for the week with a more generous calculation of uh, unemployment benefits, thereby uh, hopefully uh, having them having them uh, remain connected to that employer. Um, employers I've spoken with, uh, once the initial paperwork is submitted and, and they, if they've gotten approval, it's for a six-month period of time, and it can be renewed for another an additional six months. Uh, but the administrative task from week to week, generally it's been reported to me as rather minimal uh, to submit to the Labor Department for that. And it's completely up to the company uh, to submit people one week, none another week, a larger group in another week. Uh, so uh, within the company's control, uh, if they have full week, a full week of work for a company, um, uh, for, for an employee, they can uh, advise that employee they're working a full week. And if the employee says, no, I kind of like the shared work arrangement better, the company could say, well, we're not going to submit you for shared work because you're declining uh, an offer of uh, full-time employment. Uh, the employee does have to remain available for the, the full work schedule, if need be. Um, so it is a, a very flexible program uh, that companies are, are using, and, and hopefully if a company still has uh, the ability to continue operations, uh, it, it can be an attractive alternative to laying people off completely. Um, one um, uh, Fortunate note that I, I just got confirmed uh, this morning: um, the uh, $600 supplement that's being paid to individuals under the, the Federal CARES Act, one of the financial assistance packages that Congress has passed, uh, included a $600 a week additional unemployment payment uh, to individuals uh, at the state level, and that $600 is going to be paid to anyone receiving unemployment benefits, including those on, on shared work. Um, and, and so uh, that can be a nice enhancement to uh, both uh, help people out in, in this time of need, as, as well as maintain the attractiveness of the continuing work arrangements that are available. Um, additionally, uh, as people may have uh, been seeing in, in the news, uh, the unemployment system has been totally overwhelmed. Um, I'm amazed that they're still operating, but they, they've, the State Labor Department has some very good people working there, and, and I think that they are doing the best that they can, but there are significant delays to issuing unemployment checks to people, and there are significant delays to approving shared work applications. Um, the, the question I just had answered this morning, uh, which I had suspected but wanted confirmation, is that uh, for, for the present, uh, companies are able to submit for shared work benefits. In the calendar week, they indicate they wish to begin using shared work, um, even though they may not get formal approval for several weeks after submitting that application. So um, uh, because unemployment is considered on a calendar week cycle, I think it's Sunday to Saturday or maybe Monday to Sunday, um, uh, when, a, when a company submits for the shared work benefits, they should pick the beginning of the next calendar week as the start of the shared work program for them. Um, schedule individuals as, as they need to, keep track of the hours that people are working, and retain that uh, data. And once approved for shared work, they'll be provided with forms to submit even retroactively back to that first week of shared work uh, scheduling. Uh, and, and individuals will get retroactive shared work benefit payments back then. So, uh, again, the Labor Department being flexible as they need to and, and, and uh, appreciatively so. That was a great tip. And then um, also there's a great resource online pertaining to the shared work program. Um, the Connecticut DOL actually has a whole site dedicated to it. So if you have any other questions, um, you can always go to sharedworkct.com and they actually have a great intro video there to kind of um, explain what M Mark kind of did, but also um, offer other details as well. Um, so yeah, they, they, let's now get into... Put together a short little cartoon uh, video that, that is, is a good overview. Uh, one other point, uh, the uh, Traditionally, in the shared work program, uh, 
as, as part of the application, an employer has to check off a box testing to having um, made their application for shared work available to workers for a seven-day period and um, uh, solicited any uh, worker comments about doing so um, because of the and and that would that would be a preliminary period before they could get approval for this. Um, uh, I, I believe the Labor Department is, is waiving that seven-day period again, and it also requires uh, an attestation that the employer has uh, provided notice and posted a notice in the workplace. Because in, in some cases, a lot of people are not coming to work, they're working remotely and, and may have reduced hours but from a, re a remote work location. Uh, the questions come up, how do we notify people uh, that we're applying for shared work. Um, on the shared work website, there are a couple of links to uh, FAQs for employers and FAQs for employees. Um, the uh, the notice, uh, the, the FAQ for employees uh, is a, uh, I think it's a nice one or two pager uh, that's informative, gives the basics. Uh, I, I think that uh, sending those remote workers a link to that informational piece should suffice to satisfy the employer's responsibility to give notice to employees that they're participating or applying for the shared work benefits. So uh, a little bit of a, a strategy for coping with the, the remote work arrangements that we've all got. And no, nobody's going into the kitchen to look at the bulletin board to see the latest notice that's been posted. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, now let's get into the FMLA and Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So how do employers deal with employees who have to take off time for sick family or children and or um, an employee who doesn't feel that it's safe for them to be at work? Okay, um, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of different pieces in there to, to drill down to. Um, the uh, Families First uh, Coronavirus Response Act uh, was a, uh, a, a, an amazingly rapid enactment by Congress to expand the uh, family and medical leave law and paid, paid sick leave provisions. Um, normally, uh, passing legislation like that would, would take several months with hearings and uh, a lot of lobbying activity, fine-tuning, things like that. Uh, they, they, they sped this provision through uh, on an emergency basis and uh, it's almost like uh, launching a ship and not being sure if you've closed up the hull and put the engine in there and you know stuff it with provisions and explain to everyone how to operate that ship. But it's kind of like, well, we'll figure it out as we go along. Um, over the over the course of the last few weeks, uh, once the law was enacted by Congress, uh, then uh, a tremendous number of questions popped up. What does it mean? Who's eligible? Uh, what are the provisions here? And uh, over the course of those weeks, uh, the Labor Department and the IRS have issued uh, growing lists of questions and answers. And I say growing lists because initially they had some Q&As that were, I think there were about 30 of them, and now they're up to about 80, uh, uh, both on, on the Labor Department and the IRS. But uh, they, they've done a very good job in, in uh, pushing out some questions that are many of the typical questions that companies would have and workers would have, and, and offered ex explanations for a lot of this, and in some cases caused uh, uh, me to uh, change change course in the advice I was giving to companies because initially uh, we were speculating about how to interpret a lot of this and apply it. But essentially, uh, the uh, the law created an extension or expansion of the traditional FMLA that those businesses with 50 or more employees have come to, to know and love, um, but to expand it to apply to companies under 50. Um, it applies up to 500 uh, employees uh, or, or 500 and below, uh, and, and then um, uh, even to those companies with fewer than 50 employees. Um, before I get into the details of that, there is a, an option to be exempt from the, the, the paid, paid leave provisions for companies with under 50 employees as a small business exemption. And initially it was 
thought that this was going to be something you would apply for, get certified, and you wouldn't have to worry about it at all. Uh, but through clarification, uh, now it, it's an, an exception from the law if a company would like to take advantage of that. They would have to show that compliance with the law would jeopardize the business's viability in some way. And it only applies to the obligation to offer the paid leave in order to remain home when caring for a minor child whose school or daycare has closed. Um, it, it is not an exception or exemption from having to provide paid leave for the first two weeks of, of the paid leave provisions that's characterized as the emergency paid sick leave provisions of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. The uh, law provides for paid leave, uh, as I've alluded to, in so, so as, as for the small business exemption, it, it's not as broad an exemption as some people have thought. It's not something you apply for and get certified. Uh, it's it's more on a case by case basis, and um, and a, a, uh, there there is information within the labor department's uh, Q and A's for the type of documentation and analysis that a smaller business should examine and and consider uh, create some notes about their determination that this would jeopardize their business's viability or it's a key person they can't do without, and, and then tuck those notes aside for use later, advise the individual who's seeking the leave that they cannot provide the leave, the paid leave to that person, uh, and, and, and then um, hope that the person accepts it. If they challenge it, it might end up in a dispute before the labor department. And at that point, the employer would take out their documentation to try to defend their decision that they're unable to provide it because doing so would jeopardize the business's viability. So it's, it's not the easy, uh, oh, we're small, we don't have to comply with this provision. Um, so it does warrant some, some uh, close scrutiny. The law overall... So yeah, I actually... Yes, Sorry, Mark. Um, I actually, I actually had a question emailed to me about that, and I believe you just covered it. Um, however, someone emailed me asking, "What happens if you are an employer who has adopted the new FMLA rules but isn't legally required to? We only have about 30 employees. Um, in the best interest of their employees' health, they are offering the FMLA two-week sick time. However, they have an employee that wants." the 10 week FMLA um, sick time, I guess. Um, so will yeah. they be eligible to receive anything even though they aren't legally required to do so? Is the well, question. Um, yeah, uh, to, to two possible aspects to that question and, and um, I can't determine precisely the, the fact situation there, but um, number one, for a smaller business that could be exempt from the law, if they start to, uh, they don't have to. The, the default is that everyone is subject to the law, including those under 50. The opportunity is there for an under 50 employee company to be exempt from providing paid leave for purposes of the expanded FMLA, which covers the, the child care responsibility, uh, not the paid sick leave. And so uh, a smaller company that would choose to accept the responsibilities to provide uh, various aspects of, of that law uh, with, with both job protected leave time and, and paid leave time um, is simply complying with the law and not, not seeking the, uh, the opportunity to be exempt from it. And, and if, they, if they do simply comply with the law uh, and, and pay the benefits, they, they should uh, be sure, as, as I'll touch on in a moment, to document the circumstances for which the person is seeking time, paid time off from work, to make sure that it does fit within the covered situations. And, and then equally as important to properly document the, the circumstances of, of the leave uh, so that they'll have adequate documentation that the IRS might look for when they seek to recover the costs of that leave. Uh, through the, the payroll tax credit that's available to employers. Now, the two circumstances that I've referred to as uh, qualifying for leave under that law, uh, one relates to health issues and the other relates to child care responsibilities. 
when an employee, him or herself, is either um, experiencing um, uh, symptoms of, of COVID-19 uh, and has sought medical input, diagnosis, guidance, or has actually gone for a test, uh, that would be one of the circumstances where a person would be entitled to remain away from work uh, and, and be eligible for uh, emergency paid sick leave on, under that law. Uh, another circumstance, and, and they would be entitled to up to two weeks, and, and it's, it's phrased as two weeks, 10 days, or 80 hours. Uh, and, and it depends on the schedule of the person and uh, the timing, uh, but uh, the the 80 hours is, is one cap to think of and, and to illustrate that if a worker normally was scheduled to work overtime in, in a week, uh, the overtime hours do count. So, for example, the first week, if they worked 55 hours uh, and, and were paid 55 hours of emergency paid sick leave, and the second week, if they put in another, uh, you know, 55-hour uh, work week, they wouldn't get another 55 hours of paid emergency paid sick leave. Uh, they would only get 30, uh, 35 hours. Um, Whatever the math is, I'm talking and thinking at the same time here. But only a total of 80 hours. Yeah, if if an employer chose to pay them for all of the time out, so you know, including the overtime hours for both weeks, they could not recover through the payroll tax credit the total hours for for both of those weeks. They could only recover a, a total of, of 80 hours. So uh, that's why it variously is phrased as two weeks, 10 days, or, or 80 hours, depending on the schedule the person is, is on. Now, uh, someone who uh, can't come to work because of health concerns related to themselves, um, they're diagnosed, they're uh, self-monitoring because of uh, a doctor's guidance that they should do so. Uh, or, or, or subject to a, a quarantine because they've traveled somewhere and uh, public officials have said, if you've been to this location, uh, you have to remain home and, and self-monitor. Um, they would be entitled to 100% wage replacement for those 10 days, two weeks, or 80 hours. Um, the other health-related absence that's covered under that law is if the person can't come to work because they have a family member they're caring for uh, who has been diagnosed or has been advised to uh, remain home. Uh, and, and the medical advice is that th this person is needed to provide care for that person at home, or the individual's own doctor has said, because of your exposure, you should remain at home. But if it's, if it's a, a family member's health that's requiring the person to remain at home, they'd be eligible for the same amount of time uh, the two weeks, 10 days, or 80 hours, but it would be at two-thirds pay for, for those first two weeks. Now, the additional time that a person might also have to remain home in that initial two-week period would be if, if they have a minor child uh, whose school or daycare has closed because of COVID-19, and um, they, they need to remain home to care for that child. Interestingly, the question arose early on, what kind of documentation should an employer have? And um, uh, we, we've, uh, we've posted information on CBIA.com and, it, and it's extracted from the Labor Department's website and the IRS website. And it indicates that the person should have a notation uh, uh, who, who they are, the, the time they need to be away, and uh, some reference from a healthcare provider if it's related to a health concern. Uh, initially, the thought was they need to have a doctor's note. However, because both the CDC and, and others have suggested, let, let's not have doctors spending time writing notes. They, they need to be spending time providing care to people. Um, so uh, the, the clarification has been that either a written or, or oral report of medical care, medical guidance to remain home uh, should suffice. Um, so an employer should be asking, uh, who's the doctor? Give me contact information. So if we choose to, we can verify that. So uh, 
uh, an employee should be asked to provide that uh, in order to be eligible for that paid leave. In the case of a school closing, um, it's, it's almost universal that uh, schools are, are shut down and uh, all of that. So um, I think simply a notation of the name of the school or the name of the child care facility, possibly a screenshot from the website to show that it's been closed, just as backup documentation, again, to substantiate the individual's eligibility, but also uh, as, as documentation for the IRS uh, to back up their seeking to retain payroll taxes uh, to get a credit for the, the costs of, of that paid leave. So that covers the first two weeks. The remaining 10 weeks that you're referred to is part of the expanded FMLA paid, paid leave and is only available when someone can come to work for those child care responsibilities I, I've been speaking about. Um, it is not available for additional paid sick leave. Uh, and, and so the, uh, some confusion arose at first because the, the expanded FMLA paid leave said you get 12 weeks of expanded FMLA, but you only get 10 weeks of paid time. The first two are unpaid, but the first two then are covered under the emergency paid sick leave provisions. So um, it, the, the two kind of pair together uh, and uh, uh, there, there are some interesting scenarios that can arise uh, where uh, someone might, might end up with a, a period of uh, up to 14 weeks if, if they uh, initially took uh, time off for their own health issues for, for two weeks and then subsequently sought time off for uh, child care responsibilities. Uh, the two weeks would be the emergency paid sick leave and then uh, it could be an additional uh, 12 weeks, the first two of which would not be paid uh, for child care responsibilities, uh, but the person could get unemployment for those two weeks, and then the subsequent 10 weeks would be paid, uh, again, at two-thirds pay uh, for, for, that, for that leave period. So uh, a, a lot to uh, digest uh, with uh, that law, and, and we've been struggling with various scenarios uh, uh, with that. Uh, the, the cost of the leave uh, that's provided um, are recoverable, as, as I suggested, uh, under the, the payroll tax uh, provisions. And, and what would happen is uh, an employer should, should be documenting on their payroll the, the uh, paid leave that they're providing to the absent worker should be noted as a, a separate payroll item uh, on, on their payroll records. Uh, so that subsequently when uh, they're issuing payroll to a larger population of workers who are still working, um, they, would, they would send the net pay to the worker uh, for wages, and then the payroll taxes they would ordinarily uh, uh, remit to the IRS. Uh, they would hang on to that as recovery of the costs of the paid leave. Uh, the IRS provisions also have planetary information how to allocate, how, how to calculate the portion of group health insurance costs to the period of leave for the absent worker because they are required to maintain that leave. And uh, those allocated costs to that period of paid leave are included as recoverable costs through the payroll tax credit. So uh, you know, kind of a, 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 a total recovery of costs. It, it, it doesn't help out with the interruption of production, uh, but it certainly uh, does cover the costs of the payroll for that period of time. And are there any other questions that have been popular that people in CBIA or other business owners have been asking you that you'd like to cover uh, prior to heading to our Q&A? Uh, A lot of administrative stuff and, and, and questions come up with respect to employees' uh, PTO time. Uh, can, uh, do they have? Can they use that? Um, uh, employees can't uh, can't collect uh, company PTO time and paid sick leave time at the, uh, simultaneous. They can't get unemployment benefits at the same time. Um, one one question that has come up quite a bit, and and um, it, it's a tough one. Um, 
that uh, the the, the uh, emergency paid sick leave and the expanded family leave are targeted towards those specific documented circumstances that the individual has had consultation with and guidance from a healthcare provider to remain away from work um, uh, and and uh, and or uh, child care responsibilities. Um, in, in, in cases where an individual is just not comfortable coming to work, uh, they, they've heard the governor's pronouncements about uh, everyone who should remain at home, um, and, and yet their employer is saying we're one of those myriad essential businesses that are permitted to remain open. Um, we've arranged for uh, remote work as much as possible, uh, but there are certain tasks that need to be performed on site. So we have work available. And, and yet, at the same time, there are some workers who understandably are saying, I'm not going there. Uh, you know, I'm staying home. Uh, just out of anxiety. Uh, completely understandable that a worker would make a decision like that. However, uh, an employer um, should not issue emergency paid sick leave to that person, expecting to be able to recover that through an IRS tax credit. Uh, simply because without that medical documentation, um, they're not going to be able to substantiate that, and if challenged, uh, they'll be lacking the documentation. Um, uh, as far as uh, unemployment being a, a backup for replacing that individual's income while they're remaining at home, um, on the unemployment website that you've got there, and uh, interestingly, the, the, the snapshot you've got of the uh, Connecticut un unemployment uh, notice. Um, I, I forget which which date it has, but they've been updating that regularly as well, and that, that's been updated as as recently as yesterday. So the, the latest date on State Labor Department's website is April seventh. Um, but they did indicate that they've got a Q and A tucked within their their information uh, about uh, an employee who says. Um, my employer has called me to come back to work, and I'm not comfortable returning to work. Can I get unemployment benefits? And and the answer that they've got there is um, only if the worker can, if if work is available, uh, the worker would have to cite either some medical basis for not being at work, such as specific doctor's guidance for that employee to remain away from work, in which case they probably would then uh, be eligible for the uh, emergency paid sick leave. And if they remained out beyond the two weeks, 10 days, or 80 hours time, and still under the doctor's advice, uh, they would then be able to get unemployment benefits. Or if the employee could say, the reason I don't want to go to work is because it's it's a dangerous environment. Um, for example, uh, they're, they're making, making me work shoulder to shoulder with any number of other people. They're not issuing masks. Uh, they don't have any Purell around. There, there's no social or, or physical distancing being practiced, uh, and everybody's touching everything. That, and I'm overplaying that a little bit, but that that would constitute an unsafe work environment uh, in the employee's eyes and probably in, in the viewpoint of the unemployment office, and they would then award benefits to that person because you know, their employer is not providing them with a safe work environment. If, on the other hand, as many employers I've spoken to uh, have uh, have uh, restructured their workspace so that people are distant from each other at least six feet. Uh, they're they're providing some type of face covering, uh, whether it's fabric or, or actual face masks. Uh, they, they've got containers of sanitary wipes that people are, and, and instructions on on how to regularly work down, uh, wipe down touch surfaces, and uh, cleanse the workplace on a regular basis. Um, the latest governor's information that came out late yesterday speaks about, um, you know, having employees uh, consume meals alone or in their car, possibly, so they're not gathering in a, in a, in a, in a collective lunch lunch space. Um, uh, doing some imaginative shift scheduling uh, and, and various other steps to to allow people to continue to work, but to maintain those physical distances. If an employer has done all of those things. And, and it is purely a worker's anxiety that's preventing them from coming to work. Um, they'd be, they'd possibly be denied unemployment benefits in, in that situation. So um, it's a tough, tough call for an employer, uh, but but that is uh, the direction uh, that is is possibly uh, 
the, the determination that would possibly be made for uh, eligibility for unemployment benefits. That was a great question. I'm glad you covered that. Um, um, I'm going to turn it over to Joni. Um, I get that some people are having audio issues uh, due to the mass amount of people currently using softwares like this right now. Um, so if you are having um, audio issues, we are hearing that if you call in, you are able to hear a little better. Um, right now, though, I am going to ask Joni from our BBB to chime in with any questions that she saw in our questions box that Mark possibly um, hasn't covered yet. Hi, everybody. Um, I've tried to capture all of your questions in the question box, so please bear with us. Uh, it's a long list. Um, first of all, Mark, can staff use the EFMLA and e-sick leave intermittently, or does it have to be a straight 80 hours at once? Uh, good question, and that's, that's specifically addressed in the uh, updated information from the Labor Department. And, and what they've said is that um, intermittent leave uh, is not available uh, under the first two weeks um, where it's emergency paid sick leave if it's for the uh, worker's health or a family member's health that they're caring for. And, and the rationale behind that is that leave and, and the two-week time uh, selected is the amount of time recommended by the CDC going back several weeks now. It seems like several years. But the, the self-monitoring time when if, if someone has had exposure to COVID-19 and, and uh, they have become infected, uh, the two-week time is considered to be a suitable monitoring period to assess whether, in fact, the person does has contracted the disease, the, the virus or not. And, and so the intent is for the worker to remain away for a solid block of time uh, to avoid uh, posing a hazard to others in, in the workplace. Uh, leave taken for uh, child care responsibilities um, can be uh, used intermittently if the employer agrees to that, which is consistent with some of the uh, traditional uh, interpretations of the uh, traditional FMLA for those companies with 50 or more employees uh, may have encountered. Uh, an example of that is uh, ordinarily intermittent leave is available when a worker can't come to work because of a serious health condition, traditional FMLA. When, when a, a, a worker uh, who's had a baby uh, wants to uh, return to work intermittently or, or the, a new father a, a, a child wants to uh, come back to work uh, intermittently, um, that's permissible with the employer's permission, if the employer agrees to that. So similarly, un, under under the application of this law uh, with COVID-19, uh, for the child care responsibility portion of the leave, uh, intermittent is, is permissible uh, as long as the employer agrees to it. Thank you. Um, okay, next question. Does the shared work program have a minimum time period that the employer has to participate, say three months or six months, or is it flexible? It's that once the approval is for a six month period of time, and as I said earlier, um, uh, employers can readily get an extension of the six months if they if they need to continue with that. The amount of uh, reduction in hours that an employer applies to the schedule for those employees selected uh, can be anywhere from um, it's 10%. It has to be at least 10%, um, and, and it can be as much as 60%. So it's it's a, a very flexible uh, span uh, that allows for scheduling variations, uh, and an, an employer doesn't have to be consistent with all of the, the block of workers selected that week. I, I believe they have to apply shared work or reduced hours to at least two workers, ranging from the 10% reduction in hours up to as much as 60%, and uh, can do so with you know different amounts with different workers, uh, one week to the next, changing it out, selecting different workers uh, from from week to week uh, as they choose, and, and not participating one week if if they have enough work, so they want everybody on board that week. Thank you. Um, what if an employee elects to take a leave 
and we're still open for business, would we have to pay out vacation pay? We have plenty of work for them. I, I believe if, if an employee just says, hey, I want to go fishing for a week, you know, all this stress and everything, a little quiet time with nature would be would be real nice. Um, an employer could treat that the same as, uh, you know, they have forever in terms of a request for vacation time and, and say, sorry, no thanks. We're, we're struggling to get by here and we need all hands on deck. I uh, can't allow that. Um, and, and if the employee says, well, too bad, I'm leaving, uh, that's a situation where the employer should issue an unemployment notice to that person indicating voluntary quit and um, document the, that with the employee as well to, to, to say, you know, in response to your request to take some vacation time, unfortunately, we can't allow that right now. Um, you have chosen to disappear of, the, of your own choice. And, uh, you know, we consider that to be your voluntarily declining suitable work. You're not here. Um, we will not approve a claim for unemployment, uh, unemployment benefits. We'll challenge it. And, and uh, eventually, you know, and if the employee applies for unemployment and lies, uh, you know, issuing that UC-61 will be very helpful to document the, the circumstances uh, surrounding that. And uh, if the employee does uh, slip through the system and get benefits, uh, the unemployment system will eventually circle back and address those types of situations and, and deem it to be an, an overpayment and charge that person back. Thank you. Um, can you furlough an employee who's in the work share program? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, uh, if, if, for example, an employer submitted you know, all of their employees for participation in the shared work program, um, that doesn't insulate, well, the, the employer can selectively schedule shared work hours for any of those for whom uh, it appears to be appropriate based on the employer's needs. Uh, at the same time, an employer can reach into that same population and lay off any one of those folks, um, put them out for one or two weeks as, as a furlough week, and that individual would then get their regular unemployment benefits for total unemployment, as well as the $600 supplement uh, that will be available through the end of uh, July. I did have two questions about the $600. Um, let me find them. Um, is that a one, 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 point, one, one point? One point I'll make is, uh, if it's not asked, uh, where, whereas the regular unemployment benefits paid to workers on, on total unemployment, shared work unemployment, or partial unemployment is charged back to employers' unemployment tax experience accounts and will mm -hmm. cause their unemployment taxes to, to rise uh, sometime next year in 2021 or, or there and, and thereafter. The $600 payment is being funded by the federal government and will not be a chargeable claim against the employer's account. Uh, will the $600 be paid in full even if the person's on shared work? Yes, it will. That's okay. uh, that's something that was confirmed in a Labor Department notice uh, that was sent around. Uh, and uh, again, any, any of these documents I'm referring to, um, we've tried to post many of them on CDI's website, but if you send me an email, I, I can shoot them out to you as, as well. But uh, the, the $600 uh, is a uh, supplement to anyone receiving unemployment benefits, whether it's total unemployment, partial unemployment, or shared work uh, unemployment benefits. And is that $600 every week or a one-time deal? Every week. Okay. I, I, I don't, I don't want to say there's a bright spot <laughs> in this situation, but there are some folks who, uh, obviously, we're all struggling with you know other aspects of this, whether it's stress or actual financial implications. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of weekly compensation, there are some people who, with that 600, are probably going to end up with more money than if they had been working. Um, is the shared work program accepting new applications? If so, is it retroactive? Someone was on a webinar yesterday and they were not sure if they were accepting new applications because they've gotten so many. Now they're they're accepting they're continuing to accept applications. I see no reason for them to shut that off. 
It's not as though there's a pool of money allocated to them because ultimately uh, much of that money is going to be paid back uh, to the state through higher unemployment taxes for some time to come. Um, it, it is only retroactive in the sense that uh, today is Wednesday. If I had a company and I wanted to uh, schedule shared work hours for my employees and I submitted that application before the end of this work week, I could begin scheduling reduced hours as shared work hours beginning next calendar week, retain that information. I, I probably will not hear back from the Labor Department approving my application for several weeks, but my the, the information I received earlier today was that unemployment uh, will be accepting shared work uh, benefit uh, schedules uh, as of the week the company the, the week after the company submits the application and indicates on the application form that they want shared work to apply to that company as of that particular date. So it, it will be retroactive in in that sense. But uh, if I submit for shared work participation this week, but I've had people on reduced hours for the last several weeks, I could not reach back to those prior weeks and and submit. Uh, workers to receive shared work benefits for those weeks. Got it. Uh, if an employee's spouse is working from home and they have a small child that cannot attend daycare, if the employee wants to use the FMLA stating that he needs to take care of the child while his wife works from home, would he qualify? Uh, another interesting nuance that is addressed in the Labor Department quest questions and answers um, initially, that was not clear. They did clarify that the intent is to provide the emergency paid FMLA leave for child care responsibilities only to the person who is primarily responsible for caring for that child. So um, as is indicated in the Labor Department's Q&A and in information we posted on the CBI.com website, um, within the, the uh, items of information an employer should capture, in order to evaluate whether someone's eligible for the emergency paid sick leave or emergency paid uh, extended family leave, um, they should uh, seek a statement from the employee that they are primarily responsible for caring for their minor child. Now, um, you know, is is that verifiable? Uh, no, um, you know, or employees likely to misrepresent what's going on with that very possibly and is are they going to get caught i have absolutely no idea but um, for employers security they should ask for a statement from the individual as to who is primarily responsible in the family for caring for that child they should ask for the child's age and um, document that to back up the employee's assertion that they're primarily responsible some spouses, uh, someone I spoke to yesterday, um, the the uh, the wife is home working full time remotely. The husband is home, is unable to work remotely, and and therefore there are two parents in the household to watch the minor child, but the wife is working full time. The husband does have time available, so that would be a legitimate circumstance where the husband would say, "My wife is totally." immersed in work, unable to provide the care for the child. I am the primary caretaker in that case. Um, one other interesting note, uh, it, it's not reflected in the IRS document, uh, the IRS questions and answers, but it is in the Labor Department. Um, if the child is under 14 and under, uh, it's assumed that the parent is needed to care for that child. If the child is, is 14, uh, 15, to 18 uh, to 17 um, it suggests that the employer should have a statement indicating the special circumstances that necessitate the employee's attention to care for that child an assumption that maybe a 15 16 or 17 year old should be able to stay home care for themselves um, I'm not sure if that's going to be a, a, a consistent requirement uh, but uh, there is a reference in the Labor Department uh, questions and answers suggesting that uh, uh, they should uh, uh, seek some statement from the worker that uh, because my older child is still under 18 but over 14 uh, as and and is need of uh, supervision or monitoring because of 
fill in the blank. I'm, I'm not quite sure what should be there. Special needs child obviously uh, might be the case, or uh, uh, a child has a tendency to get into trouble, and, and therefore if I'm not home, all hell will break loose. Uh, that, in my mind, would probably suffice to, to, to meet the Labor Department's requirements. Thank you. Um, here's another question. I have an employee who is on a reduced hour schedule, but he's a senior and collects some social security, so he's not eligible for unemployment. Does he have any other options available to him? Well, um, good news that uh, so someone who's old enough to be receiving uh, social security retirement benefits and still work and, and uh, get a paycheck, uh, if they lose their job, the Social Security benefits do not impact their unemployment benefit rate. If oh. they're receiving, if they're receiving a company pension or a, a company-funded retirement plan of some sort, uh, there may be a partial offset to their unemployment benefit rate that reflects the amount of the company's contribution towards that pension plan. Uh, but uh, merely getting uh, Social Security retirement benefits. Uh, does not uh, interfere with their unemployment benefit amount. Thank you. Sp speaking of age, uh, all public health officials have clearly indicated those 65 and older should remain at home. Um, and in some cases, uh, companies have approached those individuals and said, get out of here. Um, I don't think it's safe for you to be here. And, and sometimes those individuals have uh, accepted that and, and gone home. Um, I would advise they uh, confer with their doctor who would very likely uh, offer them guidance that they should remain away from work. And that would suffice at least for the two weeks of uh, emergency paid sick leave and, and thereafter for uh, receiving unemployment benefits. Thank you. Uh, for extended family and medical leave, how do you treat seasonal employees? Is the benefit calculation based on hours scheduled on a go forward basis? Um, under the sick leave provision, there's a six month look back period. Yeah, there, there are uh, explanatory, the, the, the some explanatory comments in the Labor Department uh, Q&As that uh, review how to calculate for part-time workers, uh, the amount of pay, as well as for seasonal workers, which I believe does uh, involve, um, uh, it, it suggests going back, I think, two weeks to a month, and if that's in, in, insufficient or in, inappropriate because of the variation in their schedule, uh, to go back a six-month period. So I, I think it would be a six-month look-back period. Thank you. Now, one, one other interesting provision is if uh, if someone is not scheduled to work, um, they're not eligible for those benefits. So uh, those benefits are paid only only if there would otherwise be work available to them uh, if they weren't faced with that restriction on their working as a result of their health or a family member's health or a, a child, child care responsibilities. So, so if someone is out collecting uh, that leave and then they're furloughed or laid off, uh, they would then uh, interrupt their eligibility for the, the uh, paid, paid leave under the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and instead uh, be eligible for unemployment benefits. Okay, I have one more question. Um, obviously, there are more questions, but we're running out of time. Uh, this one is, if an individual is out and qualifies for FFCRA, paid sick leave for a dependent, are we able to supplement their pay with available paid time off, whether it's vacation, personal, et cetera, if they ask us to, because they're only receiving two thirds pay? Yeah, the, uh, that also is addressed in the Labor Department uh, documents. And um, if a person is uh, receiving uh, only two thirds pay because they're home because of uh, need to care for a family member or care for a child, um, they can supplement that with accrued PTO time, and um, uh, it, it doesn't diminish the amount they would get under that, that paid leave provision. However, I believe the only amount they can recover from uh, uh, the, the payroll tax credit under the IRS provisions 
is the amount they're required to pay under that law, whether it's the 100% or two-thirds pay. Um, one question that has come up is whether an employer uh, could supplement an individual's pay who's out on unemployment. And uh, generally, any, any additional pay provided to someone on unemployment um, does have to be reported by that claimant, which would ordinarily, uh, two-thirds of the pay given to the person would reduce uh, be an offset or reduction in their unemployment benefit amount. The uh, Another provision that was part of the CARES Act uh, with the $600 is, although the $600 supplement is only through the end of July, um, unemployment benefits normally when someone's eligible are, they're eligible for up to 26 weeks worth of benefits in the 12-month period uh, following their initial claim. The CARES Act extended that 26 weeks by another 13. So uh, individuals for the remainder after July, uh, if they've exhausted unemployment, uh, they they may be eligible for another 13 weeks of unemployment benefits uh, for a total of 39 weeks. Um, also, uh, sole proprietors, uh, independent contractors uh, will also be eligible for unemployment benefits. And the uh, unemployment uh, office does have uh, an instructional, a series of instructional pages on how to fill out the unemployment form in this unique environment we're in. Um, uh, one one major question that I've been getting that we're not going to have time to go through in detail, but there is good information available on CBI website and uh, CDC. Is um, we have we have an individual who's advised us they've tested positive. What do we do now? And, and it's uh, send that person home, tell them to remain away from home, inquire where they've spent time, who they've been in contact with in the workplace, uh, so that some extra attention for disinfecting can be paid, as well as uh, some um, uh, in inquiry to those with whom that person has had direct contact over the last few weeks to alert them of the need to confer with their healthcare provider. Um, there's two different schools of thought on what to do with those individuals who've had exposure to the one uh, symptomatic or diagnosed. Um, CDC has, uh, and, and state health department uh, through, through the governor's recommendations, uh, has recommended that person be sent home and told to monitor for 14 days. Um, other guidance I've seen suggests uh, simply advising those individuals who've had close contact to more closely monitor their health over the next two weeks, and if they experience any symptoms, to immediately notify the employer. Um, the wider population that didn't have that direct contact uh, defined as within six feet for a significant period of time, 10 minutes or more, um, should simply be advised that uh, one of our associates at work, uh, we believe you uh, has, has been diagnosed or is exhibiting symptoms, and we urge everyone to continue carefully monitoring their health. Uh, and if you experience health issues, let us know, go home. Otherwise, continue with the very aggressive uh, cleaning protocols we've had, we have in place, as, as well as the uh, physical distancing and work scheduling practices uh, uh, and, and all of that. Uh, th 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 that increasingly has become a question that companies are posing because increasingly they're being faced with reports of individuals experiencing symptoms or being diagnosed. All right, Mark, um, that is actually all the time we have today. Um, I appreciate you answering all of these questions. I get how it can be easily confusing for anybody who owns a small business to be able to know all of the ins and outs, and um, we are glad that you were here to help us all try to understand um, all of these new and changing um, opportunities that employers have, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, and what I'll say is that um, I, I can't promise how quickly I can get back to people, but um, if people have further questions, and especially if you're a member of CBIA, I urge you to join. Uh, but my email is mark, M -A -R -K, dot soicher, S -O -Y -C -H -E -R, at cbia.com. And uh, we're, we're doing our best to, to get information out there for people. Um, and we urge everyone to be careful and respectful. Um, and uh, we, we'll, we'll get through this. Uh, some of the loan programs that were addressed in last week's program uh, have been helpful. Uh, they're struggling to, to get rolling smoothly, but I, I think there are some good safety nets being built in place. 
and um, hopefully uh, we'll we'll all get through this and eventually get back to work and uh, have a wonderful day in the office. So, thank you for. The I agree. I think everybody. Yeah. All right, you too. Um, and then anybody else who's calling in, um, if you would like to learn more about previous webinars or actually sign up for upcoming webinars hosted by BBB, that shortened URL um, is bit.ly forward slash BBB COVID-19 webinar series. Um, thank you again. We appreciate everybody calling in and hope that we were able to answer as many questions as possible. Um, and again, you can go to that shortened site, bit.ly forward slash BBB COVID-19 webinar series. Um, and it will have all of today's info, recording, um, and hopefully a couple helpful links as well. Um, I hope you all enjoyed um, and we Look forward to having you on our next webinar. Thank you.